Hello, everyone. As June said, my name is Beth Johnston. I'm the Chief Community Engagement Officer here at the FSHD Society. And together here with June Kinoshita, our Director of Research and Patient Engagement, we'd like to welcome you back to our FSHD University Educational Webinar. So for those of you who don't know us, the FSHD Society is the world's largest research-focused patient advocacy organization that's focused solely on FSHD. We've got 33 chapters now across the US and in Canada, and we are part of the 20 Country World Alliance. Our mission is to find treatments and a cure for FSHD while empowering our families. So we host these and so many other events to give you, our families, an arsenal of knowledge so you can be your own best advocate when it comes to your care and empower you to better understand research and actually the role that you can play in accelerating therapy development. So this is the time for all of us to activate, to activate research, to activate in our community and to activate ourselves. So without further ado, today from our wellness and research department, we welcome Isaac and Ora Prilatensky. They're gonna share their work and research on what's called the mattering effect and how feeling valued and adding value can really shape our lives. So I don't know, June, do you wanna properly introduce Isaac and Ora? Uh, absolutely, thank you. Uh, so I think today's talk really fits into this concept of activating yourself, that if you are, you know, you need to feel strong in yourself and confident in order to feel that you can have agency in the world. And that's really important. We want everybody to have that feeling. And it can be uh, hard if you have a degenerative condition like FSHD and you have physical disabilities um, and they're progressive. Um, it can impose, uh, you know, can be a challenge for any individual. Um, and this is something that Aura and Isaac uh, understand deeply because Aura was herself diagnosed with FSHD, um, I think when she was in her late teens or so. Um, but she has um, you know, learned how to be very resilient and both of them have devoted their academic work to this, the promotion, the study and the promotion of well-being. Uh, so um, we are really uh, very proud to have them be here today, be part of our community. Uh, just some quick, um, you know, uh, credentials, I guess you could say, is uh, Dr. P Isaac Prolotensky is the former Dean of the School of Education and Human Development and, and holds the Irwin and Barbara Mountner Endowed Chair in Community Wellbeing at the University of Miami. And Dr. Ora Prolotensky uh, is a retired professor from the University of Miami, where she directed a major in human and social development. They've also written many books, including most recently, How People Matter, Why It Affects Health, Happiness, Love, and Work. So with that, I will turn over the mic <laughs> to Dr. Ora, Dr. Isaac, it's all yours. Well, so thank you very much uh, for having us uh, today. Uh, today, as uh, June was saying, we will talk about uh, mattering, uh, well-being, and disability. So before we start, we want you to know a little bit about where we're coming from. The green arrow represents my life. The blue arrows represent Aura's life. The red arrows represent our lives together. Ora was born in Israel and grew up both in Canada and Israel. And I was born in Argentina and moved to Israel as a teenager. We met in Israel and then we started wandering the world. From Israel, we moved to Canada, then to Australia, and then to Nashville, Tennessee, where we were professors at Vanderbilt University. And then in 2006, we came to the promised land of Miami. One thing we both learned living and working in different parts of the world is that we all have a fundamental need to matter. So mattering is about feeling valued and adding value. Feeling valued means feeling loved, appreciated, and recognized as a human being. When we come to a new place, we feel valued when people pay attention to us, ask us how we're doing, and just overall notice our presence. 
adding value in turn is about making a contribution to myself or others. For example, I can add value to my life by studying a new language, finishing a degree, or starting a new and meaningful relationship. I can add value to others by offering help or providing emotional support. I can add value to the community by starting a recycling program. In other words, there are many ways to feel valued and add value. But both of these experiences are really crucial to our well-being. So here you can see what we call the mattering wheel. And in, on the left-hand side, you can see that we can feel valued by ourselves, by relationships, by the work we do, and by other people in the community. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see that we can add value to the same domains of life, to my own self, as I was saying before, by picking up a new skill, like an in, add value in our relationships at work and in the community. And the more we succeed in doing new things, adding value, the more we feel valued by ourselves and others. It, because the more we contribute, the more feedback we get about what we're doing. Now, on the other hand, if we don't feel valued by others, our self-confidence diminishes and we're less likely to take risk and try different things. So when we feel diminished and devalued, our confidence goes down and we're just more hesitant to participate in the world. We can now ask ourselves, why is mattering important to personal well-being? Well, we know that when people feel that they matter, they are more likely to experience self-compassion, autonomy, mastery, good relationships, overall well-being, self-acceptance, and many other important outcomes. So this is all great news. But when mattering is blocked, we end up with all kinds of problems. In contrast to the positive outcomes associated with mattering, when we need, when they need to feel valued and add value are blocked, are thwarted, we develop a series of problems. We can feel invisible, helpless, and suffer from exclusion and ostracism. There are positive and negative ways to deal with perceived lack of worth. Some negative ways include becoming entitled and aggressive to compensate for feeling devalued. Some constructive efforts include the civil rights movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the fight for disability rights of and the fight of disability right activists. So the ADA, for example, is a great example of turning a situation where some people don't feel valued into a positive uh, result. So some negative reactions, as I said before, entail becoming aggressive and even xenophobic because I don't feel valued. So. In our view, mattering is such an important part of our lives that we decided to write the book that June was referring to, How People Matter, Why It Affects Health, Happiness, Love, Work, and Society. And now I'm going to turn it to Ora, eh, who's going to continue for you. So we're doing musical chairs. Here we go. I'm rolling around so you can already see that, I'm, that you can see my wheelchair. And um, I, before I start, and I'm going to now talk a little bit about challenges and opportunities for mattering for those of us who live with disabilities. And I just want to say, um, I want to do something that I've actually never done before in a presentation. And that is this morning, I thought, oh, I need to change things. And I ended up adding a slide. So I'm going to be a little less scripted than I like, and I hope you'll forgive me. 
uh, for that, but I thought it was important. So I may make some changes along the way. At any rate, the, the slide that I put up here is developing a healthy self-regard as people with disability. It's important to point out that how we see ourselves, our self-regard, self-worth, self-esteem is inevitably related to how others see us and the messages that we get about our worth as people, right? This is why self-esteem has been one of the most researched topics in psychology. And, um, you know, our, and the, our, the self-esteem is developed in the context of relationships. So children learn to see themselves based on how they are treated by others. So when children are, children are loved and cherished by their parents and are consistently given the message that uh, this love is not contingent on how they look or how well they perform in school or how strong or popular they are, they are more likely to develop a healthy sense of self that's not contingent on external measures of success. Um, I think all most of us know this, and that's what usually what good par what parents try to do for their children. But of course, it's not only parents that shape our self-esteem. When kids interact with others outside the family, especially when they start to go to school, they also receive messages about themselves, their worth, and so on. And adolescents in particular tend to see themselves as others see them, as others see them. Um, and they are keenly sensitive to how they are seen, and they incorporate this, this, this information into their sense of self. Um, and also, because they have such a strong need to belong and be accepted by others, Things like social exclusion, rejection, and so on is particularly painful, especially to teenagers who will do anything to avoid it. And as we know, this is also, adolescence is also a time when messages from peers become often more important uh, to kids than the, the messages they get from their parents. So, um, you know, this is a common theme in narratives of people who grow up with a disability. But it's not only children and adolescents who compare themselves to others. We are all comparison machines. And many, you know, many people learn to evaluate themselves and their worth based on uh, sometimes on external measures. Um, and this, this is the source of many mental health problems, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and so on. So I, I say this by way of saying that it is undeniable that people with disabilities often receive or have received some harmful messages about themselves and about their worth. It doesn't mean that someone comes up to you and tells you you're worthless necessarily, but you know, there are different ways, subtle ways in which dignity can be diminished when people feel ignored, disrespected, disrespected, and so on. And sometimes for some people with disabilities, the most painful parts of their lives are that stigma, isolation, um, and, uh, and erasure. Sometimes, sometimes even more so than the disability itself, depends what they're dealing with. Um, Rebecca Tosic, who's an author who wrote, Sitting Pretty, uh, my, my Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body. This was a, a book that came out last year. She said, I'd come to see my body as a glaring problem, a weight on the world, a failed prototype about growing up. And she's a fairly young, fairly young woman. So um, I just wanna kind of say this as something for us to think about. Um, particularly important, a risky thing for adolescents and, and, and young adults who so need the approval of others, which is why it's so important, especially for children and adolescents with disabilities, to be given consistent messages that they are loved and valued and cherished just as they are. They are whole people just as they are. That doesn't mean we don't, you know, we don't want to cure episodes or come or find treatments. Of course we do but we're still whole people just as we are. Um, so uh, really important to continuously emphasize that, that our, our worth is not contingent on any of those things, how we look, how our body functions, uh, and so on, which is why for many people, discovering the disability community and meeting others who share this aspect of their identity can be so important. The message that you're not alone, that you're not the source of the problem, that you know, and that you can feel valued and add value and thrive, all that is, is possible. And, and, um, and for many people with uh, disabilities, understanding how that experience is shaped, not only by the disease, but also by the built environment and the 
social environment has been import an important realization because it gives them something to work uh, for, for change. And of course, we know that many gains that have been made for, uh, for people with disabilities, like the ADA, has happened as a result of disabled people who kind of came together and became activists and kind of fought for, you know, for the rights and for to end discrimination. So this is just another perspective that I wanted to bring to you. And I think I already took about half my time. So I'm going to, uh, so I'm going to try and um, move a little faster. So, you know, so, so we, all, we all know that living with a significant disability like FSH can present some unique challenges to mattering, right? We know that it's an experience of exclusion or kind of sometimes a painful thread in many people's lives. Um, adding value also can be hampered by kind of the combination of disease progression, as well as these barriers uh, in the environment that we were talking uh, about. Now, instead of me lecturing about a grand theory of, of mattering, I just really want to speak from the heart and give you, share some of my experiences as a fellow FSH, FSHer, who's quite significantly impacted. I've been using a wheelchair for many years, and I just want to share one experience of leaving my, my job about eight, nine years ago where, where I was at the University of Miami, Fort Miami teaching and directing a program. And I knew I had to leave because, my, because it just got really hard to, to do my work along with disease progression. I loved my work, but the, the more disabled I got and tired and achy, just work became, work became an all-consuming affair. There was too little energy left for anything else. Uh, and sometimes not enough of those that I care and love about the most. So I put the quote up here by Helen Keller, when one door of happiness closes, another opens, but often we look so long at the closed door that we do not see the one which has just been opened for us. And the reason I put this up is because I think for a while, um, I was kind of in that space, really struggling to let go of my career as a path to happiness, but it was not helping me. So I did start to examine other doors that were opening up, there was more of me to give to others. Uh, I was able to invest more in the relationships that matter most. Isaac and I were able to spend more time together to develop, to develop a program to promote well-being, write a few books and so on. So this is just an example. Uh, I'm sure you have your own, this is my journey. You, you, you all have your own unique way of adding value to yourself and to others. Uh, so even if, you know, one, you can no longer engage in a certain domain or at the same level of intensity, there are other ways of adding life, in, of adding value and making life as meaningful as possible. And of course, just within our beloved FSH society, there are multiple opportunities for getting involved and adding value. So I highly, uh, highly recommend it. Okay. So I'm going to um, speak for a few minutes about a model of well-being that we developed. I'll do it briefly because I did talk about it in a previous presentation, just for to, to give you a sense of, um, of things that we could do to experience greater well-being for ourselves and, and also matter uh, for others. So we developed this multi-dimensional model of well-being that we call ICOP, which stands for interpersonal community, occupational, physical, psychological, and economic well-being. These are different domains of life where we can be happy and healthy and matter. And even when there are challenges in one domain, so one domain becomes too complicated, there are other domains that we can work on. So a question that we can ask in when we talk about well-being and mattering is what can I do by myself? to improve my mattering and well-being, and what can we do together with others? So I just want to mention a model of change that we developed that uh, is based on, on, the, on seven proven strategies, and it forms the acronym that I can. And these are skills that they stand for behaviors, emotions, thoughts, interactions, context, awareness, and next steps. We call these drivers of change that work synergistically to promote well-being. And each one of those drivers can be translated into action by two skills. I'm only going to, to touch briefly on a few of them today. Behaviors, emotions, thoughts, 
and interaction. And we're starting with behavior because really, to, if you want to improve your well being or to take a step toward mattering in some way, um, it, usually that requires action, right? So the Dalai, the Dalai Lama once said, happiness is not something ready made, it comes from your own actions. And these actions are a way to add value. So whether you, you wish to learn a new skill or start to meditate or start a new FSH chapter in your community usually requires a behavior change that is consistent with the value, something that we want to do. So in the intervention, we focus on how to set realistic goals and how to pursue them. Um, and, and, and often we sometimes need to be able to turn a small change in from behavior into a habit that becomes an automatic part of our routine. And sometimes even making a small change can make a difference. So for example, uh, we have recently set a goal of getting up earlier in the morning by 6 a.m. And this is because mornings, I get tired really easily and mornings are my best hours when I'm least achy and most alert. And I wanted to, to extend the morning so I can spend it on kind of some meaningful projects. And uh, even though this was a minor change in our routine, it made a big difference for me, not only my productivity, but also in my mood and general outlook. Now I say we, because I can't actually get myself out of bed on my own. I think kind of gets me up and helps me get into the shower. And so, so it, it, it really is kind of a, a joint effort. So I'm moving on to emotions because knowing how to, to manage our emotions is really important. And uh, in the intervention, we focus on both how to manage negative emotions and how to cultivate positive ones. So there is a lot of evidence. I'm gonna start with the with positive emotions. There is a lot of evidence that uh, there's so many things that we can do, no matter where our, our, what our starting point is to cultivate more positivity into our lives. And uh, so for just one example, uh, there's a lot of evidence that cultivating an attitude of gratitude is good for your health, your relationships, your overall well-being. So simple practices, such as keeping a gratitude journal or counting one's blessings have been really found to have a lasting impact on life satisfaction. This is just one. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a link later to an intervention if you want to look at some of the other things that we have there. So it's also about you know, nurturing positive relationships, following your passions, building on strengths, and so on. But it's also really important to, ma to manage negative emotions. We all have them. They're an, a normal part of life, even though we don't like them. And we can't really escape them. In fact, when we actively try to fight and resist how we feel at any given moment, we usually make things worse for ourselves. So you know, whatever we resist tends to persist. But we, instead, what we can learn to do is to make room for negative emotions is, is, I'm not saying it's an easy pro process, but we can learn to make room for those emotions and accept them without judgment. That's what mindfulness is about. And we can also learn to treat ourselves with kindness and compassion when we, when we struggle, just as we would treat a good friend who is suffering. That's what self-compassion is about. So what we can feel, we can are more likely to be able to heal, especially if we are kind to ourselves when we struggle. And uh, I think I'm going to skip the thoughts here. This is about how we learn to, it's about our self-talk and how we can learn to kind of uh, not take our thoughts too seriously and, and um, adopt kind of healthier self-talk about ourselves and our situation. I'm going to move on to interaction because this is about the importance of investing in relationships. Of all the factors that impact our well-being close and supportive relationships with others is really the number one factor. So we need to invest in relationships, especially with those who are closest to us, like family and friends. So connect and communicate. These are the skills um, that, we, uh, that we teach under interactions. It's about how to practice good listening, manage conflict in a constructive manner, and improve interpersonal communication. Close relationships have a high level of interdependence. Uh, especially where disability is concerned, but always one person's decisions and actions has a strong impact on the relationship partner. And this is especially true when 
significant disability like FSH is part of the equation. So many re healthy relationships are about reciprocity, right? Especially if let's say you're talking about a couple of relationships, it's about reciprocity, giving as well as, as receiving. So everyone's needs must be must enter the, the equation and be taken into consideration for the relationship to thrive. Now, this is particularly important to consider in caregiving situations, like the ones that Isaac and I have. If, as I got more disabled, he's taken on more roles, and especially during the pandemic when we couldn't get any help. So um, Isaac has kind of uh, coined the term that we use, and it's called share giving. And it's really a reminder of our commitment to reciprocity, right? Especially as, again, as my condition has progressed. So yes, he helps me an awful lot. There's a lot of caregiving that goes on, but I also have a responsibility to contribute to his well-being. So we call it share giving. I'm not holding us up to some kind of a, of a model or suggesting that we do it perfectly, but this is an aspiration that we strive for. So these are just some of the books, the Latin guide to a better life that some of those skills are based on. And we put at the bottom, uh, funforwellness.com. If you go to funforwellness.com, this is just a, a free resource that you can find with some of those skills that we mentioned. So now to kind of uh, conclude, there's no doubt that living with uh, FSH is a real challenge, right? It is a physical challenge, a psychological challenge. It's often an interpersonal challenge, an economic challenge, and so on. So these challenges are real, but the opportunity to feel like we matter is no less real. So we can start by identifying one area in life in which we can do something, however small, to make things better for ourselves and for others, right? We can help others feel valued for who they are. We can uh, mentor another person with a disability or fight for social justice or uh, join a clinical trial or start a new FSH chapter. There are as many ways to add value to society as there are people with disabilities. We, we know things that many people do not. We have a lot to offer. We are resilient in ways that many people can benefit from. So it is within our power to create opportunities where we can feel valued, add value, and help others do the same. So um, I'm gonna stop talking and we'd like to open the discussion. Do you wanna add from the community or leave it? Um, I can do it in two minutes. Yeah, I'm going, to let Isaac, um, I'm going to let Isaac continue. We're going to add a few, uh, just a, something about, about community well-being. And these are some of the questions that we want you to consider and we'll also consider your questions after. So, so I come back to these questions, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to show a little bit of the research that they, we've done uh, with some students and colleagues on the impact of fairness uh, on wellness. And um, we conducted uh, some studies. I'm showing here the results of uh, studies we conducted with individuals. We ask people, uh, how is your experience of fairness, of being treated kindly with respect in your family, at work and the community? How is that impacting your well-being? So it turns out that there is what we call a direct impact. This is the blue line, you go from fairness to wellness. So people tell us that the more they experience fairness, justice, uh, respect, dignity in their lives, the higher their level of well-being. That's a direct impact, but there is also what we call an indirect impact because as people experience more fairness, more justice in their lives, they feel more valued and they have more opportunities to add value. So this is just to emphasize the importance of fairness in mattering and in wellness. And then just the last study I wanna share, we conducted a study comparing countries, entire countries on whether 
uh, social justice uh, elements of the country, like the ones you see on the screen. And it's really important to pay attention to labor market inclusion, social cohesion, access to education. So in Germany, they developed this social justice index that we can apply to see how different countries are doing in terms of fairness and opening up opportunities for minorities, for people with disabilities. And what we discovered in our study, there were 42 countries in the study, that the, the higher the countries are in terms of social justice, the higher the level of life satisfaction. This is what we call, again, a direct impact, but, it, but there is an indirect impact because countries where there is more access to resources, where there is more intergenerational justice, more inclusion of people with disabilities, people report higher levels of autonomy and more social capital, which really means participating in civic life. So these are just two types of studies we conducted recently. And just to, to summarize everything, uh, I like to conclude with one of my uh, mottos in life, which is that there is no wellness uh, without fairness. So now I wanna go back to the questions that Ora posed uh, before, so that um, we can hear from the audience, right? So Ora, why don't you take it over? Yeah, so we're, we're happy to entertain your questions or comments, uh, but we, we put we put down some questions for you to consider if you want, you would like to discuss that, the ways in which you, you matter, how do you add value, when do you feel valued, what are some barriers, which ones have you overcome that others can learn from, and, and so on. So I'm turning it over to to June. Well, thank you so much. You're getting a ton of love in the chat section. People really, uh, what you're saying really resonates with them. So, so thank you on their behalf. I will also um, suggest because some people may want to share a story verbally rather than having to type it in. There is a raise hand function. So if you want to um, make a comment, try to keep it brief because we're, we have constrained time. But if you want to share something, um, verbally raise your hand and we can um, call on you. So we have a question here from Jennifer. She says, I would love advice on how parents can help develop mattering in our kids. Um, what are things that parents need to avoid to make kids feel like they don't matter, uh, even though if they of course do? I guess that old parental trap of inadvertently saying something without realizing how it might land <laughs> in the ears of a child. You know, the first thing that I'd like to say about that as a parent, you know, we have a now 34 year old son, and I don't think that there is a single parent who will not one day look back and say, gee, I wish I hadn't said that, or it, it's, that, that's just part of life, right? We're not, none of us are perfect human beings and we will make mistakes. So just to free parents of that, that feeling that, that we have to do it perfectly and that we, we're going to shatter our kids by, uh, by a comment or if course that's not the case. At the same time, I think, especially when we're talking about kids who are different in that way that they come to school and they have, uh, you know, they live with half a sage and then and they're, they are, they're interacting with their peers and they get different messages. I think the more we can come back to that message, give them opportunities to uh, work with their strengths, to, um, you know, to do things that they love and that they're good at, good at. So some kids, a lot of kids are into sports, but they may not be able to do that, but there are other options. You know, our son who lives in New York, he's a chess coach. And I thought, gee, chess is a great thing for, for kids with disabilities because you don't need to be able to, it's just one example, you don't need to be able to, um, to, to be athletic, to engage in it. So give them, giving them opportunities, giving them messages of being valued, I, I think helping them interact with mm -hmm. others who will give them that message. I really am a believer that for many people, finding adults with disabilities who are thriving in life, it doesn't mean that they don't struggle, but who are doing well and who are working and that, that you know have a meaningful life can be really important for young people. That's what we know actually from all the research that mm -hmm. we've done over the years about disabilities. For many people, that was like, wow, yes, I could see how I can be an adult mm -hmm. in that way and finding others like themselves yeah. as well. 
Thank you so much. I think I think uh, also I've heard from you know some young people and also from parents that uh, you know often a child you know develops a disability and their peers don't know what it is and they tease them about it. But if you are open about it and sometimes depending on the age of the child, you sometimes you involve the school and helping to. Oh, one child had a presentation. It was a science presentation explaining what FSHD was. And the teasing stopped immediately. People now said, oh, I understand why you walk funny or whatever it is. And now all of a sudden she could tap into the, the inherent empathy. Kids, you know, there's a lot of empathy there. You just need to unleash it. And, and I think that was, that was a really important lesson. I've, we've heard of other kids who told their sports team they had FSHD and the coach and the whole team adapted to play. And, you know, the, the uh, kids could, was playing in a state championship, you know, team. I think because that's they were, important. Yeah. Right. Yes, I think that's such an important point, Jean. Absolutely. I wish somebody would have done that for me when I was young, and had all these, uh, absolutely incredible. I still think that kids need to be, depending on their age, if it's adolescents we're talking about, they need to be in control, right, of who they speak to and how that's done, but yeah. absolutely important. Absolutely. Well, as a parent, you have to listen to when, when your kid is ready, but, but also as a parent, you can show them there is an open door here that they may not have seen, you know, so. Um, so if you have other questions, please go ahead and post them in Q&A. We have um, a lot of people just saying that's an important question. That's great, thank you. And um, I had a question um, speaking about in couples because I, again, this is something we hear a lot is people um, often define their value in a relationship and in a family as being able to do all the, you know, do the cooking, do the clean, you know, kind of take care of the household, pick up the kids, do all these things that may become too physically taxing. Um, so, and then they aren't sure what to do. They feel they don't have a role. So what are some ways that uh, a spouse with a disability can still take responsibility in the partnership and and it's not a share it's not a one-way thing the share it's a share giving thing the, the spouse the able-bodied spouse also has to make space for that i guess so but can you perhaps share some yeah, examples of that i absolutely can but i don't want to take uh i want to kind of hog the the, the, the mic here but I, i'll just share that when we had our son years ago 34 at 34 years ago, I could actually, after the, after the first few months, I could no longer safely pick him up on my own because at that point I was already affected by FSH. I was not in a wheelchair, I was walking, but it was some difficulty. So, uh, that, so that's how we raised him. And, and it's really important to remember that contributing to a family, to children, is not just about the physical things. Even in parenting, after the first few years of life, it's not so much the physical, it's, it's other things, it's guidance, it's love, it's, and there are, there are so many ways that, of course, you do need supports around you. I was pretty lucky, there was, you know, we had Isaac, we had my parents live next door at the time, which was hugely helpful, and we got that, the kind of help that we needed. But there are ways to do those things, and in a partnership, I think that there are ways to, to contribute what we can. So right now, for example, I'm responsible for all the cooking and the, and the grocery shopping at home. Now, I can't do any of that physically myself, but there is, there's Amazon, you know, there's grocery delivery. And I, I do have someone coming for a few hours every day. And what she does actually is she does that. She, she, she cooks and she, I direct her, but she does that. And for Isaac, that's great. Isaac would much rather help me uh, get out of bed and, and into the shower than start to chop up vegetables, for example. So we find a way of doing that, but it's often a negotiation. You have to think about how do we make it work? What works for me? What works for you? So it's, uh, there's no one answer. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to add that having that conversation can be challenging, you know, for either side to say, I need more help here. Um, and a part of the solution is approaching the conversation 
in an inviting way, as opposed to a guilt tripping way or an accusing way, or just simply avoiding the whole issue because it's uncomfortable. Uh, so I think it's important what Ora was saying earlier about interactions, how to, how to have a conversation where we start the conversation by saying, you know, I'd like to express some needs. I would like to hear your needs. How can we put everything on the table and come up with a solution that works for everyone? So Ora just gave examples of the practical things she does. You know, the shopping, the Amazon, the internet, the guiding our helper with cooking and all of that. But it requires a conversation about what are the different needs of people. And I, I would encourage that. I just, I'll just add to that. Sometimes these conversations are not easy. And, you know, for example, for a while I was sharing, not this is before the pandemic, it wasn't so easy for Isaac to kind of express his need. Isaac loves climbing and hiking. Well, obviously we can't do that together. But we really wanted to, to, to make room for that because that's important, right? He has to be able to meet his needs as well. Otherwise, this is not going to be good for him or for me or for the relationship. So we find, we, we, you know, we are looking for ways to make sure that this is part of that share giving we're talking about. Mm -hmm. no. Actually, it's not different at all from what it takes for any relationship to be healthy, but... Uh, but perhaps with a progressive condition like the physical conditions might evolve more quickly and more noticeably. Um, but we all change through life, right? We, and we should, and we want to, but you have to constantly renegotiate your role in a, any relationship as you change. I think that's probably the uh -huh. case. Uh -huh. and, how, and what about in relation to work? Because I think that's someplace where people feel super vulnerable that they're being paid to do something that with a predefined role and when their ability to do that changes, that's very scary. Yes, yes. So I'm um, I shared a little bit about retiring. So maybe you want to pick that, pick on that, pick up on that. I just want to say one thing about that, that sometimes in some cases, it's also our internalized you know, at times, it, it, yes, it is sometimes about the the, the work, the, the willingness of work environments to accommodate, but sometimes we all people can also have internal barriers. And I have to admit, despite all my years and you know my my knowledge of disability rights, and the, I was really struggling with um, trying to thinking that I have to do it all. It was so important for me to not let my disability get in the way, maybe a little too much. So it's okay to also bring ourselves and our real bodies and our struggles. You know, everybody becomes, um, with time, all bodies become more frail. And as a society, we're better off, really, when we, when we make room for people with different challenges, right? And so it's actually good for, so I'm just, this is a way of saying that sometimes there are ways of remaining, um, even in a work environment, depending on the situation. Not if you're a firefighter, or it depends what you do. And think about this as, as also something that can benefit not just yourself, but the environment. I think that for that, that teach that students seeing me teach from a wheelchair was actually probably an important message, right? About the value mm -hmm. of people with disabilities in society mm -hmm. as well. And I, I'd like to add, I saw a question from Alan about Alan about the, how to add value in different ways. I think that was the question, June, right? Mm -hmm. And what, something I'd like to say is that um, there are so many ways to add value by being a good listener, by offering emotional support, by offering wisdom. And um, Aura doesn't need for anybody to toot her horn, but uh, Aura serves a very important function in our family and we have a lot of friends and and family members who rely on her wisdom and her good listening. And, and I try to do the same. I always say, or is a far better psychologist than I am, but, but I try to do my share too. And there are a lot of ways of asking people, how are you doing? And, and just lending a listening ear and an open heart to empathize with people 
And we all have struggles in life, those with disabilities, those without uh, physical disabilities, and just uh, reinventing ourselves and thinking of how can I be helpful in ways that do not necessarily entail uh, physical uh, actions, but there are so many psychological actions like lending support, celebrating other people, asking how they're doing, being a sounding board. So I think there are many ways to help that do not necessarily involve uh, physical actions. And I, for me, the key word is alternatives. How can I think of alternative ways of adding value. This goes back to what Ora was saying about the I Coke model. You know, that if I if I can, I don't know, make money or I can do some physical things, maybe I can enrich interpersonal relationships or I can add to the community. So it's a question of reinventing ourselves. What can I do differently? Yes. And I think um in some ways is we all reinvent ourselves the world is changing we're changing um so it's part of a continuum you don't have to feel like this is these are unique challenges just because you have fshd too you that it's just part of the human journey um i was interested in what you're saying at the end about the fairness gap and how um you know the sense of and that resonated with me because I'm concerned that in our in the US, I guess the US society, there's maybe a perception and experience of a growing fairness gap that things and I've noticed that, let's say, in their disabilities that so many things that people take for granted are just so difficult. If you have a disability. Um, just talking to a parent the other day whose son would like to learn to drive, but it's there's a huge barrier to his getting the training to drive, you know, with to get a special van. I mean, it just you know, given that cars are so essential to personal, you know, personal autonomy and freedom in a lot of parts of the country where there's no other means of transportation, it's um, and I know you've been active uh, in disability um, advocacy and, and rights and so on. Is there um, anything you can share from that experience? So, you know, what, what can people do to feel some sense of agency against some of these big systemic failures and unfairnesses? Yeah, it's a really good point. I wish we had longer to talk about it. I'm just going to say, I know I as a class, are we still okay? I think teachers yeah. from two to five. Yeah, so we so have five more minutes. Five okay. Minutes. <laughs> because teaching, yeah. I think this is really important what you're saying, June. There are places, and I think hopefully these are, these are things that we can aspire to as a society, that we do understand how those structural barriers, lack of resources, lack of um, um, gaps in, in fairness, affect people, they get under your skin and affect people's lives. And this is where I think, again, it's not that it's easy to make change, but there are also some policy changes that can happen, right? So, um, for example, that you, with, you know, with, uh, with, with Medicare, for example, it's an issue. Yes, there are many things that there are lots of opportunities to get involved for those who are interested. It's not something we are currently doing just because of time and energy and but there are opportunities to get involved also in the yeah. policy change right I, I think the key is uh, to find something that you are passionate about and that it's easy to do right right so maybe in the workplace you can promote more inclusive policies in your workplace uh, for a while ora participated in the miami-dade county commission on disabilities so she was pushing for better transportation for people with disabilities. So if you think about the levels of analysis, you know, it's like work, neighborhood, community, national policy, federal policy, state policy. And the question is, where can you get involved? And there are many organizations, including the FSHD organization <laughs> and many others that advocate for the rights of people. I just want to add a, a, just a, a personal reflection 
on what is it like to be in countries where you don't have so many barriers. You know, no country is perfect, obviously. But, you know, we've lived in Canada for 15 years and there is universal health care. And we experience the benefits of not having to worry about the private insurance and so many barriers to access to health care. Um, our son's wife had a stroke um, and she couldn't continue working. Long story short, they are self-employed. They are paying $2,400 a month for health insurance, right? So in Canada, that was never a problem because, you know, it's universal health care. I'm just giving you one example. Okay. There are many of how different countries organize themselves to help everybody to be more included. So let's not forget that we can learn from other countries what they are doing well, just like they learn from the U.S. what's, what's happening well here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, I know you have to run. I did want to express my appreciation for your acknowledgement of how the FSHD Society has also worked to create channels for people in the FSHD community to add value and feel valued through our volunteer activities, through the chapter directorships and walk and roll. And that was really important to us. We felt there are people out there who want to have a role and make a difference. And we fought very hard and worked very hard to create those channels, you know. So so thank you for the shout out. We we didn't, we didn't, I promise we didn't ask or to say anything <laughs> like that. But uh, no, I, I, I absolutely applaud. We applaud what the FSH is doing to really not only not only you know develop treatments and cure and so on but really to help people feel valued and add value. And it's, it's, I, I think it's, it's really quite impressive what with, you know, with limited resources and what the, the society is doing. So I'm, I highly recommend uh, for people to get involved at whatever level is right for you. Okay. Oh, we have one other question. I mean, Isaac, if you have to run, you, that's okay. You can just <laughs> head off, but if, or if you have a minute, Crystal says, how do you maintain authenticity and honesty when you have constant pain and don't want to sound like a Moni mini? <laughs> so I let Ora answer that and then we will depart. Okay. I, mean, okay. I, I can say the problem is that we are in Isaac's computer and that's where he has to log on. Oh, okay. That's the, that's but the you, you, you can answer the question. But um, yeah, look, there's no doubt that's a big challenge. That is a big challenge. I, I won't tell you that I don't struggle with that myself because of course I do, but that's okay. Part of it is like that is life. Yes, we, you know, the, 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 we ache and we, so uh, you know, energy struggle is an issue. And yes, does it get me down? It absolutely does. That is part of life. But that doesn't mean, uh, so we can deal with that, accept it, grieve for it, but, and also strive for ways to be as healthy and as happy as we can be. I think it's this, it's not this or that, it's this and that. And it's just I, a matter of not, not getting stuck in it. Right, and I wanna say something as the partner, you know, it's not like I don't complain about things, you know, <laughs> but I think for a partner, what's important to develop is to control your need to fix things. Because as partners, we can fix FSH, you know, uh, or just like when I complain about work or whatever, or I can fix it, it, what we need to do is just be a good listener and be with the person mm -hmm. and not just convey a message that you're either complaining too much or that I don't know what to do, so why don't you do X? No, let's, let's contain our need to fix things. Mm -hmm. uh, we need just to be with the person and be empathic and acknowledge that life is hard. It's hard for the person with disability. Life is hard for people without disabilities too. And we just need to be there for one another without rushing to fix things so that the complaining stops. It's part of life. We all have a responsibility to look after ourselves and our partnership. And with that, Yes, I have to go to teach. Okay, thank you so much. Well, I'll bring back Beth to say some, but thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. We really appreciate you. Yeah, we'll have another minute. That's okay. okay. Thank you guys. Bye, bye And take care. Lovely seeing you all. Mm -hmm.
Well, okay. I just want to thank everyone for attending our FSHD University webinar today and our very, very special thank you to our guests, the Pilotenskis. You guys had excellent presentation, super relevant discussion for so many of us. So thank you so much. Um, our next FSHD University webinar is Thursday, October 21st at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern. Topic, very, very much requested, pregnancy and the reproductive genetic counseling. Um, our, we have three wonderful guest speakers, um, Dr. Sane Vincenten and Nicole Vermans of the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and also Dr. Jacinda Sampson of um, Stanford University Medical Center. So please join us next month. It's a very, very hot topic. Um, also, just please visit our website event calendar for all of your upcoming chapter, wellness, and educational events. They're all there. And again, thank you so much for joining us today, and we will see you next month. Bye-bye for now.